Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you, if I could really see you. But I'm thankful that we've been able to do a video this morning and complete, at least, or get close to completing our Hebrews Bible study. Um, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Um, we're going to begin there in Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to, as is my custom, I'm going to start... Uh, uh, reminding you where we've been and where we're headed. Uh, so if you recall, in chapter 12, we were looking at the beginning of chapter 12, and it was just after the faith chapter where we look at the hall of faith, and uh, we see the, uh, the direction that's given to us. In chapter 12, it says, Wherefore, Seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, I didn't mention this last time we, we met, but let me just go ahead and mention it now. Um, it's running with patience. This is not necessarily a short race. It's going to feel like a long race. And sometimes people wear themselves out, and they get... Uh, they they forget. We need to run with patience because it's a, it's a long race and we want to be there at the finish line as well as at the starting line. Um, and of course, God tells us here, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the throne of God. Now notice one thing about this particular passage here. It says, for the joy that was set before him. Why did he endure the cross? The cross, For the joy that was set before him. And one of the things we're going to see as we go through chapter 12, we're going to see that chapter 12, the key word in chapter 12 is the word afterward. It's the word afterward. And you recall we got, we got a sense of that as we were going through the book. And um, as we were going through the book, uh, that we had to uh, think about the, the afterward part. And uh, chapter number 12 is going to focus on that afterward part. And when I say the afterward part, if you recall in chapter 11, that these saints of God, who are our witnesses, not th that they're witnessing us, but they're testifying to us about what God did in their lives and how God gave them uh, a, 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 um, a result of their faith. And uh, we saw uh, that they hadn't received it yet. And so that's going to happen afterwards. And so we have to keep in mind that that's an afterward thing. And when we think about our life here, when we think about what we're doing here, we need to keep in mind our focus. Our focus is on afterward, not on what we get here. It's not on the, the wealth we get here. It's not on the, the products we learn to grow and love here. It's on the here. It's on the afterward part. And so he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. He didn't experience that joy necessarily when he was here on the earth. It was set before him. The joy was set before him. And that's going to be the same thing for us. Then he says, consider... Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. <clears throat> he goes on to say, Ye have not strived against, I'm sorry, ye have not resisted um, unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as to my children, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. And recall that we spent some time looking at that passage of scripture that takes us up to chapter number, or takes us up to verse number 11. And, and we're going to use verse number uh, 11 as our bridge to our lesson this morning. But when we see that, we remember that God is preparing us for a home in heaven. God is using his, his, uh, uh, I want to say talent. 
He's using his skill to conform us into the image of his son. He's, he's making, that's what, that's what we're here for. That's the joy that's set before us. That's the goal that's set before us. That was the goal that was set before the, the Christians in chapter 11. And it's something that's coming to us. But we need to be chastened sometimes. And I'm not going to re-teach that lesson on chastening, but it's important for you to know that if you are a child of God and you're disobeying God, you're going to be chastened for it because God is going to conform you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. But now if I look at chapter number 12 and verse number 11, just to begin our lesson this morning, the Bible says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Well, I will tell you, uh, I agree with that. Uh, chastening does not seem joyous. When my dad spanked me, it didn't seem joyous. Um, and so he's right when he tells us the chastening doesn't seem joyous, but grievous. But, now look at the next words. Nevertheless, afterward. Afterward. That's the key to the book, to, to chapter 12. It's what's happening afterward. Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And so we need to recognize that the chastening, even though it doesn't feel good to us when it happens, it comes to us because we've been disobedient. And, and, and even in our disobedience, and even in our, the resulting chastisement, it yields us the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And so the result is going to be good. Again, that's the afterwards part. It's an afterwards thing we're looking at. Then he says, Wherefore, lift up thy hands. Now here's a whole passage here where he's telling us, uh, as a result, what we ought to be doing. He says in verse 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the fe feeble knees. Boy, let me tell you, right, right now, I feel a lot of feeble knees. I feel a lot of hands hanging down. And it's easy for us to grow weary. It's easy for us to feel tired. It's easy for us to lose our endurance and lose our strength. That's why he tells us to run with patience the race that is set before us. We need to keep that going, keep it going, keep it going. And we see here, uh, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths with your feet. I would like to be able to do that even more now. I make straight paths with my wheelchair now, but that's <laughs> another story. <clears throat> um, lift up thy hands, hang down, make straight paths with your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let rather it be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, it's interesting that word holiness that we see there, we're going to see it pop up again and again as we go through this section. And um, I'll point out some things there when we get there. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And so we're being introduced to the, the notion of Esau, and we don't, we don't uh, um, get from this passage of Scripture that Esau was a saved person. We get that he was an unsaved person. Uh, and it says, One morsel of meat sold his birthright, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he had found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And so there was a sense in which Esau, when he realized what he had done when he sold his birthright, he was selfishly trying to reclaim that birthright and even, even in tears, but he couldn't. He had thrown it away already. 
And so that's how we indicate that uh, Esau was not uh, saved, even though um, he, he desired it, he found no place of repentance. And the reason for that is because he wasn't repenting because of God, he was repenting because of him. He was selfish, he was want, wanting the, those uh, rewards. Then he says, For ye are not come unto the mount which might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Now he's talking about Mount Sinai in this passage of Scripture. And you recall, as we looked at the uh, book of Hebrews at the beginning, we said that the book was written to Hebrew Christians. It was Christians who were Hebrews. And what was happening among them was that they were tending to revert back to their Judaism, their Hebrewism, by after they got saved, they would go back because, boy, they took a lot of flack for being saved. They would go back and they would start to go to the synagogue again and they would start to do the things that, uh, that the Hebrews would do. And if you remember, I, I reminded us that that's the same thing that we do. We go back and we, and we, we try to live in the world. We try to enjoy the world's blessings. We try to buy fancy cars. We try to do all the things that would, that would make us uh, wealthy and healthy in, in the world. And uh, it's the same thing that those Hebrew Christians were doing. They were not, uh, they were not seeking after God. And um, even though they had gotten saved, they hadn't grown in the Lord. And recall that, uh, I think I asked the question last time I spoke, I asked the question, uh, what is the major topic of the book of Hebrews? And someone said the major topic of the book of Hebrews was that Jesus is better than. He's better than the angels. He's better than the priests. He's better than Moses. He's better than all these things. And that's true. He is better than all those things. But the point of the book of Hebrews is that we need to mature. We need to grow in our Christian life. And they hadn't grown. They were not mature. Chapter 5, it talks about how they, weren't, they had not matured. And, and the author here says we need to get into chapter number 6 and start moving forward in the direction. He wanted to tell them about Melchizedek, and he wasn't able to tell them because they were too ignorant. They were too immature. So he takes that topic on. He gets them into Melchizedek and talking about it. But the point is, the point of this book is, how do we grow? How do we mature as Christians? How did they mature in chapter 11 as Christians? Well, they exercised faith. And when they exercised faith, they received the rewards of God. They received the, the, plant, the uh, uh, giving of rewards that would happen in one day. And so um, we see here, you are not come into the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. And he's reminding them about the Mount Sinai. You're not, re you're not going to Mount Sinai. You're not going back. And the, and the sound of, th of the trumpet and the voice of words, which, which voice they that heard and treated that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. That means we can't live according to the law. The law was not given there to save us. They couldn't endure that which was commanded. And so much as a beast touched that mountain, it shall be stoned. Even, even a poor animal couldn't touch the mountain. The, the, law, the law is so uh, uh, flawless, it's not bad, it's flawless. But it's so flawless, we can't even touch it. We can't even get there. And so it says, and so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But now look what he says in chapter, in verse number 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. 
which were written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect saints. And now look, he's, he's going he's gonna to wrap it all up. He's going to close it all up right here. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now what, what does he mean? Than that, than that of Abel. Which blood is he talking about? The blood of that of Abel. Well, the blood of Abel was the first sacrifice that we saw in the scriptures. Abel offered the sacrifice that was acceptable to God. But what we read here is that Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So while Abel was was uh, offering a sacrifice that was fitting or appropriate for God, it wasn't a sacrifice that could take away sins. It was a sacrifice that was done to honor God and to bless God. And so, uh, so we see him there. He that ye refuse him not, see that, see that ye refuse him not, and that speaketh. For if they escaped not, who refused him that speak on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Now again, let me remind you, this is not a book, this is not a book about salvation. This is a book about growth in the Christian life. And so when we see verses that look like they're talking about a loss of salvation, we need to remember that you can't lose your salvation. The Bible teaches that very clearly. We went over verse after verse after verse that, the, that you, you can't lose your salvation. <clears throat> and so what we're seeing here is when, when the... Uh, Hebrew Christians were listening to the voices of their uh, of Mount Sinai, I'll call it, and 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 following those. Um, how much worse is it going to be? How much how much uglier is it going to be if we listen to the voice of him? If we fail to listen to the voice of him, that um, it is more than that. Um, so it says, um, See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not wh him whom refuseth not, uh, sorry, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. And so uh, the point here is, God has given us instructions. He's given us the maturity, the key to maturity, and he's telling us how we ought to behave ourselves. And when, when, he's, he, when he's telling those things, he's speaking from heaven. It's not speaking from earth, like obey the commandments, obey this. He's speaking from heaven. And so it's a different uh, uh, emphasis. And if they couldn't even uh, uh, escape, how are we going to escape? We're going to be chastened. We're going to be chastised. Why? Because God is trying to make us into what he wants us to be. God said he wants to have a church that's without spot, without blemish. And, and that church is going to be in heaven without spot, and without blemish. It's going to be that way because God is making it that way. And we as Christians are going to be that way because God is making us that way. The purpose of our chastisement is to help us grow to be more like Christ. Help us to grow to be more like the, the, the goal he would like us to be in heaven. And so he says... <clears throat> whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more shake I not the earth only, 
but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signify the removing of those things that are shaken, those of things that are made, those that, that those things which are shaken may not, may remain. Those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be removed. I have to stop there. Our kingdom cannot be removed. There's nothing that can remove our kingdom. Why? Because God's put it there. And if we have the occasion or if we have a, 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 a thought that we can somehow lose our kingdom or we can not get there, we're wrong. We receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. And he says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Wow. That's quite a punctuation mark to this chapter. Now, what is the chapter about? What is he talking about? He's talking about what's going to be like afterwards. Afterwards. Chapter 11 leads us into afterwards. If you think about how we, how we got here, in the early chapters of Hebrews, we see God explaining to us that these Hebrew Christians were immature. They hadn't followed what Christ was warning them and was teaching them. And as a result, they were, they were um, immature as Christians. And we need to remind ourselves that we carry the same immaturity, if you will, when we don't obey God and follow him and do what he would have us to do. And so um, when we see the book of Hebrews opening up unto us, that's what we see. You guys are, you guys are failing to become mature Christians here. It's time you grew up. You, you ought not to be um, um, getting taught by the word. You ought to be teaching the word. And then he goes on and tells them about, look at all these, uh, these uh, symbols that God has given you. He's given you symbols of angels, and he's given you symbols of Moses, and he's given you symbols of, of priests, and, and, and given you symbols of tabernacles, and given you symbols of, of uh, um, um, sacrifices, and all these things. But all of those are just pictures. They're pictures. But you want to go back to the pictures. You want to go back to the, to the, the, uh, the, the murky ones. You want to go back to the voices that spoke on the earth. And he's saying we need to be going after the voice that speaks from heaven and following after the voice that speaks from heaven. And so here we see the conclusion of that. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For God, our God, is a consuming fire. Now, our God is a consuming fire is not a warning to me in terms of my salvation because I know that I've been saved. I know that Jesus Christ saved me. But I do know that if I don't listen to God, he's going to chasten me. And that chastening is not a pleasant thing. Now, afterwards, it yields a pleasant thing, but it's not going to be a pleasant thing. And so we need to keep that in our mind, what's going to happen afterwards. So this chapter, chapter number uh, 10, chapter number 11, leads us into um, the Hall of Faith. 
and chapter number 11 tells us that these uh, all these people in in the, in the Bible um, were 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 manifesting faith in their lives, and that it was a good thing for them, and that uh, that they would one day receive the promise. Let's go back just for a minute, and let's go back and take a look at the close of chapter 11, if you will. I like to start at verse 32. What more shall I say? This is verse 11, chapter 11. What more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of death, of fire rather, escaped the, the verge, the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the alien. And we read all those things and we're pleased that God blessed them by giving them victory in these so many different ways. But then we see women received their dead raised to life again, which is a good thing, and others were tortured. Wow, that doesn't sound like such a good thing anymore. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. They might obtain a better resurrection. They're looking forward. It's an afterward thing like we see being briefed and introduced in, in chapter 8. Um, and others had a cruel mocking and scourgings, yet moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being a, um, a destitute afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. <laughs> the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Why is that? Because the promise is coming afterwards. We like to think that having conquered the, 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 the bad guys was the promise. No, no. The promise is coming. They haven't received the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they, that, that they without us should not be made perfect. And so we're going we're gonna to enjoy this perfection that comes to us. That's why he tells us at the beginning of chapter 12, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and again, remind you, these are not people who are uh, 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 who are uh, watching us. They're not up in heaven looking over the the, the the archway of heaven and going, oh, let's see how Tom's doing. He's doing awesome today. Yeah, good for Tom. Great, Tom. Keep up the good work. They're not watching us. We're supposed to be watching them. We're supposed to be learning from them. When witnesses testify... They tell us what they've seen, what they've been through. And these witnesses were surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Who are these people? They're witnesses who are testifying that God will give them promises if they'll only stay faithful to him. And then it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then we begin with our discussion of chapter 8, I mean chapter 12, where the key thing of chapter 12 is afterward. And it was introduced in chapter 11, the last verse of chapter 11. Second to last verse. These, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Why? Because it's coming afterward. It's coming afterward. Chapter 12 is a discussion about coming afterward. And it's coming afterward, not afterward in the fashion of Mount Zion, I mean, uh, uh, of Mount Sinai, afterward in the fashion of Mount Zion. Not afterward in the, fount, in, in the, in the style or in the, in the picture of um, the law, which, while it's perfect, it doesn't save us. Not in the picture of um, uh, words on, on the earth. 
but afterward is in the picture of words in heaven in Mount Zion in heaven and uh, city of Jerusalem in heaven and all these other uh, images it's all about the afterwards it's all about the afterwards and so our job is to grow and be mature as Christians <clears throat> We've talked about this before, and I think it's important to remind ourselves the, the aftermath uh, I think sometimes we don't, uh, we don't understand what it means to be mature. I think sometimes we don't. We think being mature means, you know, I go to church faithfully, I do this and that. And in some ways, it kind of has a picture of I go to the tabernacle and I follow the, this person, that person. We need to be like Christ. We need to be like Christ. You're going to see when we get to chapter 13, you're going to see what being like Christ is all about. And uh, that's an important thing for us to know. And so um, for me... Um, I view chapter 11 as being like the transition to the end. And, uh, and so as a result of that transition, um, I think it's probably appropriate for us to um, close our lesson for the day and um, contemplate, are we growing in maturity as a Christian? Are we becoming more Christ-like as a Christian? Or do we find ourselves getting more chastened as a Christian? Because we want to go back to the world. We want to live back in the ways of the old, the old ways. Let's always look to be more mature and grow in our Christian lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, uh, Lord, that you would be with this class. And Lord, that you would use these lessons to instruct and to teach us and to help us, God, as we mature and try to be more like you every day. Bless the class for coming. I pray that you'll be with our pastor this morning as he preaches. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.